So hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much uh, for being here. This is How to Be Old in Tech. Uh, I'm Lisa Smith. You can find me at Lisa D. Smith on Twitter, Lisa at Women Who Code. I'm an engineering manager at, at Zapier, and I'm a founding director of our local chapter of Women Who Code here in the Triangle. And I'm also an old. I self-identify as old. It's uh, it's something I wear proudly. I'm not, I, I won't, uh, I have a little story about how you can tell how old I am. There's a little rocket and a moon here. I share my birthday with the Apollo 11 space launch. So now all you space nerds know exactly how old I am. Shout out to the space nerds. Tech has an ageism problem. Now, tech has a lot of diversity issues, clearly. And ageism isn't one that is focused on frequently because we have so many diversity issues. Uh, but how old, how old is old? Uh, in tech, it starts at 41, which is a shock to many people. Uh, surveys indicate that 82% of the workforce is 40 and under, but nearly half, 46%, is 35 and under. In the very near future, like within the next five years or so, one third of the workforce of the country will be over 50. That's kind of a disconnect. Tech needs a lot of people. And if we're ignoring to a full third of the workforce, it's gonna be rough. But much like sexism and racism, ageism not only affects the person who's being discriminated against, but the larger company it deprives a company of needed perspective and tools and staff they need to innovate. DNI work needs to include age as an area of concern and effort. And uh, an easy way to do this is to consider non-traditional pathways when you're looking at somebody to hire. Uh, I myself have a non-linear career path and I will classify that as a feature, not a book. Uh, I started off uh, as a librarian. And just about everybody who met me was like, really? A librarian? Huh. And after a time, I began to believe that there might be a type mismatch between person and job. Uh, you may have noticed I like talking to people. Not a huge asset. I also was told I have um, a big personality, which is not valued in librarianship. That was a whole other story of, of a job that I wasn't suited for. But anyway, while I was a librarian, I taught myself uh, how to code. And this is back in the old days when you could know kind of everything there was to know on the internet, wrap your arms around the whole thing. And so I learned how to write HTML. This was pre CSS. We were hand coding HTML and tables, the dark days. Um, so I was an old school web developer. At my very first web development job, I learned how to write active server pages, which was super cutting edge technology, but the server lived right across the hall from my desk. I could go over and reboot it anytime I wanted to. Um, but throughout my career, I've been all kinds of things. Uh, I worked for an alumni association. I worked for a newspaper as an online community uh, moderator and the online coordinator for the news. So I worked in a newsroom. I was, uh, I did investigative work for a South Carolina school system about their web presence and their technology. I built a giant, I was part of a giant uh, effort to build a Medicaid management information system for the state of North Carolina. I was a technical webmaster at a hospital. I was a builder of bespoke content management systems. I worked for agencies for a very long time. I worked in a giant e-commerce operation. Uh, and then I became an engineering manager. So I've done a lot of things, but none of them were, I didn't have a CS degree and I didn't take a traditional path. Cause in between there, I took time off to be a, a mom, a stay at home mom. Uh, I helped uh, retired folks in a resort town fix their computers. Uh, I've done all kinds of stuff. All of this brings a lot of perspective and all of it brings uh, a varied sort of background that is an asset to, to any company. Um, so I've had a thousand jobs or ish, you know, one or two. 
And you might say, sure, that's great, Lisa. How do I get a thousand jobs? Well, you might not want a thousand, but you're probably going to want one or two, you know, over the course of your your tech career. Um, and it's not a, a process you can automate necessarily, but there's a simple three step process. I'm here to share it with you. Number one, learn things. Number two, meet people. And number three, take chances. Okay, we're going to start at the top. Learn things. What kinds of things should you learn? What do you want to learn? What interests you? What is uh, super uh, hot, trendy, great, awesome? What sparks your interest? What's a thing that you can use both in your work life and maybe in your personal life? What's a thing that you like doing with your family or your friends? Learn those things. Build stuff. Break things. It's not going to work right the first time, so just keep going at it. Go to hackathons, volunteer at community codeathons, go to conferences. Just about every conference this year has got some sort of either free or very low cost registration. Go to a conference you never thought about going to because it was in uh, the other side of the country or, or it was in another country. You have lots of opportunities this year. You don't even have to step on a plane or leave your, your, uh, your comfy sofa. Um, so learn and learn lots of things. Don't spread yourself too thin, but you know, if you only know one thing, right? That can be very tempting when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? So don't hold yourself into a corner. Don't get too one track about anything, but keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening in technology and what's new. Um, I got my first PHP job without ever having written a line of PHP because there was a cool uh, coding exercise and I had a great time building it and it was super fun. And when I got to the interview, they were like, what's your weakness? And I was like, I don't know, PHP. And they're like, well, clearly you did enough to, to get this project that we really like. We'll teach you the rest. And that's a secret that not a lot of people will tell you is that you're gonna learn a lot of what you do on the job. I'm not saying you don't come in with any skills at all, but I knew how to solve problems with code, which makes me super versatile, right? I also got a React job without ever having written React. The uh, job ad said they were looking for somebody with three to five years of React experience, which at the time was likely someone who was still working at Facebook because React was still fairly new. And so I went to this interview and I said, look, let me show you a chart of JavaScript framework adoption and abandonment looks like the Himalayas two years and two years it's over and done and people move on to the next trendy thing so do you want somebody who only knows react or do you want somebody with a proven track record of language acquisition I can pick it up and learn it and they bought it and they hired me and I got to learn on the job, which is a very concrete way of learning, at least for me anyway, when I'm doing something practical or something that I um, have you know, reason to be using it rather than just sort of an abstract project, then I'm gonna retain more of that. So that's my learning style. It might not work for you, but that works a lot for me. So you're gonna take something from every job that you have and leverage it to get the next job. Even if it's, I never want to do this thing again, that is a valid thing to know and understand about yourself. Um, I had a, a very uh, stressful experience at one job that I turned into a case study to get another job. So even if it's an experience that is not super positive or isn't really, you feel like at the time, helping you learn and grow, you're going to get something out of it and just use that as a lever to get the next thing. So number two, meet people. When I was a librarian, I got, uh, I had the privilege of going on uh, something called the Tar Heel Bus Tour, which was brand new uh, and was organized by our very uh, wonderful, forward thinking, very, uh, very, very smart chancellor, Michael Hooker. And on the very first day, very far, we're leaving the parking lot of the Friday Center to go on this week long bus tour. And the chancellor sits down next to me in the empty seat. And so we start chatting. 
and we're chatting about search engine technology. Here again, I will show you how old I am because the height of it at the time was Ask Jeeves. Super exciting because it was a meta engine. It searched other search engines. This was pre-Google. And so we talked about this for a while and uh, the chancellor said, Lisa, uh, I can't help but notice that you are working in a job that seems almost exactly opposite of what you really want to be doing with your time. Can you tell me why that is? And I said, Chancellor, sir, that is an excellent, excellent question. I'm going to get back to you on that. Uh, I love that he was able to just like sort of zero in right on my, uh, right, see right through to my soul right there in a very uh, quick time. He was a philosopher, so he used to do that. But I met the person who would give me my first online job while I was on that trip. So it seems like random circumstance, but you're going to meet people and those people are going to introduce you to other people or other opportunities. I started the local chapter of Women Who Code, and one of the first places I went to visit as a location sponsor was Spreedly. And Spreedly apparently started recruiting me right from that moment. Um, and that took a couple of years, but like I, I met them because of Women Who Code. Our very first Women Who Code uh, presentation was from somebody at Zapier, which is where I work now. So I learned about the company then and I started using their product and then I met people there and that's how I got that job. So you never know where that connection is, is going to lead. Uh, my personal philosophy is typically take all the meetings. You don't know what that person might know or might have to offer. It sounds a little exhausting. You might not want to take all the meetings, but definitely don't turn down a meeting from somebody that you maybe have never met before or an opportunity that seems sort of remote just because you've never done it before. That could absolutely lead to something else. And I know it sounds like random chance and it kind of is, but also the more you do it, the more likely you are to make a connection there. Um, you, have to, you have to go places. Right, there's my, my giant finger quotes, COVID finger quotes. You don't have to like physically go to places, um, but you have to go to spaces where people are meeting, right? So find uh, online communities. They don't have to be tech focused necessarily. They can be something you're interested in, but find those places where people are and, and, and go there. Find a group that shares some common interests, something you have fun, seek out those communities and, uh, and join them because Networking, I, I know it gets a bad rap, right? It's a buzzword. People are, you know, got to network, got to network. But networking is really, again, it's a very simple process. It's meeting humans and talking to them. But it's not just about connecting those people. It's about connecting people with people, people with ideas, people with opportunities. That's a lot of what we do uh, at Women Who Code. So if you're looking for a place and you can't find one, come hang out with us. We're super cool. Um, and if you don't like talking to people, which I get, uh, I'm an outspoken and, and gregarious kind of person, but that's not everybody's uh, style. If you're talking to somebody and it's not super comfortable for you, ask them one question. And I guarantee you, they will talk for quite some time. People like talking about themselves. They'll talk and you can nod, smile, make encouraging noises, but you don't really have to carry that conversation. But chances are they're going to say something in that course of the conversation there that will lead to another question that you can ask them. And even if it feels like you're just interviewing them, like for a, uh, an article about what they do for a living, fine. That's totally fine because in the course of that, you're going to find out something you didn't know, either about the company they work for or the kind of job they do or the kind of work that they're engaged in. And that's going to be super useful. Um, find that network. Uh, networking is is easier if you have a place or a group that you can do it with. You need help, you need support, you can't do this alone. So that's really why I started the local chapter of Women Who Code. I know that um, women in technology across the triangle were kind of spread out, um, we're all over the place. I was typically the only woman engineer wherever I was working. I figured if that was the case, it was the case for lots of other folks. So I thought we should all hang out and we do. Uh, Pre-COVID, we went to brunch once a month. We're not doing that now, but we certainly have lots of activity that we're still doing. You can hang out on Zoom. I know it's a lot to ask after maybe spending all day at work on Zoom, but these are very low key opportunities. They're very relaxed. They're very accepting. We're always looking for speakers. If there's something that you're interested in, learn it and then come talk to us about it. That's the secret of public speaking. You only need to know just slightly more than the people you're speaking to, and sometimes not even that. 
because your perspective is valuable. So even if you're talking about a topic that everybody knows uh, everything about, or at least that's what you think, you are going to bring a perspective to it that they don't have. And that's cool. Like people want that. All right, so number three, take chances. Explore new opportunities. Go to conferences you never thought of. Apply for conference grants and get free tickets. Even non-COVID times, you can do that. Volunteer for free tickets. That happens too, anything you want to. Uh, and this kind of the same, the same philosophy, take chances when applying for jobs. Remember this, that typically, at least in tech anyway, Men will apply for a job when they meet only about 60% of the qualifications, but women feel like they need 100% of the listed qualifications to apply for a job. And I'm here to tell you that you don't. I'm not saying ignore the job posting, but they're typically laundry lists of all sorts of things, skills, qualities. I'm talking to companies, I go and talk to them about how to improve their hiring practices and that's one of my first asks of them, stop writing these ridiculous laundry lists because no one human can embody all those things. Nobody should. And honestly, when you're hiring for somebody that you really want to help advance your team or expand your capacity, you're looking for qualities. You're looking for, um, for the, how they approach problem solving. You're not looking for, do they have three years of Excel? Like there's a baseline of stuff. I'm not saying apply for, you know, senior engineer if you're just starting out. But if you see a job posting that has something interesting in it that speaks to you, that has something in it that interests you, what's the harm in applying? The very worst case scenario, you don't get a response. That's rude. I like to apply to places where they have kind of a response, even if it's no or no thank you, you've got a response. But there's no harm in applying. Um, and just a little uh, internal statistic, at Zapier, the majority of people who work there have applied three or more times. I was at uh, our retreat in January back when we could still travel. And at the table I was sitting at when we were talking about this, person at my table had applied six times. I don't know if I have that much resilience. After having been told no for four or five times, I probably don't know that I would have applied the six times. But you get turned down once, that's not necessarily no. That means no for this specific position right now. Things change. Staffing needs change. Technology changes. Uh, perspectives shift. Just because this job today was not the right fit doesn't mean that that job tomorrow is not going to be. So apply, apply for the jobs. Apply for all the jobs that look interesting to you. So these are your three easy steps, but you don't just go one, two, three and stop. You keep doing this over and over and over again. You get all of the possible jobs. You talk to all the possible people. You have a uh, virtual coffee with somebody who uh, hits you up on LinkedIn. You talk to somebody that you met at a conference and that leads to something else. Like at Women Who Code, we have found people jobs. We have found people new jobs. We have made connections to people who have worked on projects together. Women Who Code isn't the only place to do that. Um, so look for those places. But if you're having trouble finding it, hit me up on LinkedIn. I'll connect with you. We can talk anytime. <clears throat> find, find, find that network. It's going to be there for you. Um, my slides went backwards. There we go. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, I'm sure we've got some Q&A happening here. If you wanna talk about diversity in tech, hit me up, Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever you would like. And, and that's all I have here. So now we can, we can talk, I see there's some. Yeah, there's quite a few questions. Ready? First of all, everybody misses brunch. Right, brunch is one of my favorite things. Um, and, and I promise we will brunch again. We'll probably have a virtual brunch coming up soon. Um, but yeah, that was, that was one of my favorite things. It's a very low key networking opportunity. Cause honestly, you go to yeah, a place food. everybody's clapping, right? You totally deserve claps. Thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> you do have a number of questions. Um, and I'm going to start from the first one. 
Okay. Uh, so it, Greg says, if a senior dev has five years of experience, what is someone with 25 years? And my answer <laughs> is wizard. That's exactly right. Lean into that, right? Because your 25 years of experience brings something to the table. And I am also talking to companies about like, if you see somebody with 25 years of experience applying for your job, don't discount that as person as overqualified because that's a bunch of nonsense. What that is is a valuable perspective because honestly, if you've been in technology as long as uh, Denise and I have, you've seen <laughs> trends, they come back again, right? We've learned yeah. lessons. It might not be in this specific language, but we've learned lessons that prove themselves over and over again. And so that kind of perspective is super useful. Yeah, actually InnerSource, which I spent the last five years on is something I first heard of 20 years ago and it didn't land until open source won. So we had, for, there were 15 years where nobody wanted to talk about it right. before right. I remembered that it was out there. So, right. exactly. okay, um, somebody wants to know how you came up with the magic number 41. I'm gonna guess that's oh. how old you are. No, it is not, as a matter of fact, I appreciate you thinking that, but no, I am <laughs> beyond that. No, it's not a, it's not a magic. So the, it was that from this, the, the large industry surveys, they said 40 and below, is where the majority of the tech workers live. So if you're past that, you're old. <laughs> According to the tech industry anyway, I'm not saying that myself, frankly. Like I said, even though I self-identify as old, you know, I think a lot of it is how you, how you um, respond to things. In my mind, old is when you're inflexible, you're not open to new opportunities. And if you have those things, then yeah, it doesn't matter what the age says. Yeah, you're that's not, what you're I not think old. too. I mean, I started uh, open source. The term was coined the year that I turned 39. Yeah. And yeah. I've done 21 years of it. So, right. you know. I've been working online since before there was a Google. So, yeah. like. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, here is common problem in our area, requirement of a master's degree for a job that pays 18 to 23K. How does that even make sense? And how do you get around it? <laughs> Um, it doesn't make sense. And honestly, like any place that has a hard line on degrees, is probably a place you don't want to work anyway. Yeah. Right. But typically like the way you get around that is like, just like, I mean, it's, it's very, very common in academia, but it's common in a lot of other places. Like, you know, uh, no degree and this many years experience, a bachelor's degree and this many years experience, a master's degree and this many years experience. And you can equivalent that out. So like, if you've been working in the industry a long time, you probably have more practical knowledge and somebody with a master's and I, this, I am somebody who has a master's so I'm, I'm, I'm okay saying that it, it doesn't your your degrees don't necessarily equate to any real world experience that a company is looking for so anybody who's got that line and it's very cavalier and easy for me to say that's probably not somebody you want to work for if they have that perspective they're not yeah. going to be open to to, to innovation frankly there's supposedly <laughs> going to be a million vacancies you know in tech by yeah. the end of this decade. So yeah. there is another job. There is always another there job. Is always. And, I can tell you. <laughs> I've you have a to lot be able to walk away. I, you know, yes. I mean, I, if you look at my resume, it's sort of a who's who of the time that I, that I was working. Yeah. But it, it, I didn't ever try to work for any of those companies except for Apple. Apple's the only one I actually cared to work for. The rest of them found me. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, and then the other thing about the underpay once again, that's, do you really want to walk to work? One of the great things that Lisa said at the beginning of this talk is it's possible that we're never going to have to take the low salary in order to walk to work again. Right. 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 And, and that's the thing too. So like, I guarantee you, if someone is paying very little money, they will very soon find themselves out of employees because we're smart enough to talk to each other and ask and know what market value is. Especially so, in open source. <laughs> especially in open source, right? So like, while my, my company um, Zapier is, uh, is global, we're globally distributed, we peg our salaries to Austin, Texas. So it's not quite Bay Area salaries because honestly, who can afford to pay that? But it's also uh, you know, over and above what a typical market value um, is in a lot of places up and down the East Coast not New York, but you know, so it's, it's a nice median. So you can always find there's all sorts of sources to know what market value is. And if a company is not willing to pay you market value, you do not need to work for them. That's correct. 
<laughs> okay, how do you handle burnout and learning fatigue if you've been in tech a long time? That is an excellent, excellent question. Sometimes you take a break and you don't pick up anything new. You dive deeper on something that interests you or you immerse yourself in something that is enjoyable. Don't work yourself to the point of burnout or fatigue because you're not going to be useful to yourself or anybody else. Right. And I get it where there's like so much stuff happening. You want to learn everything. Don't learn everything. Find something that's fun. Find something that you have a friend working on. Find a project that you can jump in on. Open source is great because there's all kinds of projects out there. You can look around and find something that interests you. Find something that like sparks something in you. Heck, build Legos. Like anything to keep yourself active and doing something new that you've never done before doesn't have to be, you know, some like the hottest technology. Because honestly, again, like I said, two, two to four years, it's probably on the outs again. Yeah. Does anybody remember Flash? I used to be a Flash developer, right? We don't do that anymore. <laughs> I spent lots of time doing that. We don't do that anymore. And that's the thing. Technology is always evolving, but you're always going to find something that's interesting. And there's always, honestly, people probably won't say this out loud too much, all languages essentially are the same, right? There's yeah. different syntax. There's some different approaches. But if you know how to solve problems with code, you can pick up any other language. Yes. That's just how it is. We're lucky that way. But if you're having learning fatigue, the other the other trip tip that I have is go get a physical. Try to figure out if there's something ha true. changing in your body, because we have jobs that don't let us move enough. And Lisa's up there dancing the whole time, but I spend a lot of time sitting, and <laughs> and um, I definitely my IQ points go down as the day progresses. So um, have a look at that. It's it, you owe it to yourself. Yeah, and that's um, an important important safety tip too. Sleep right? Eat food that is good for you and move around. That's it. That's all you need to do to, to stay like more active in life. Okay. Here's somebody who is um, sort of worried about lack of progress. So how does he make a difference or they make a difference when there are people five years younger than them doing similar jobs to the one that they have because they haven't moved up? I mean, that, that is definitely a thing that you can feel or you can ignore. Because uh, I mean, when I was at um, uh, a previous company, I helped redo our, um, our career trajectories. Mm -hmm. And I stopped calling it a ladder because a ladder yeah. goes one direction. You're going to be climbing over your colleagues. That sounds real rude. Also, it's a ladder also is not- It's also fairly ableist, right? Exactly right. And it's also, it's not comfortable to stay on a ladder in any one position. So instead I called it a pass because a pass it's a beautiful garden. You walk through. Sometimes there's a bench and you sit down and you hang out and you spend some time there. There should be no impetus for you to progress unless it's a thing you want to do. If you find yourself stagnating, look around and see, is it because the company that you're at is not offering you opportunities? Fine, look someplace else. If you see people around you, it's very much like comparing your own picture to say a supermodel in a magazine, right? totally different scenario. Also airbrushing, right? So like things are not exactly what they seem. You don't know what that other person has done to get their, their work, but it doesn't matter. What matters is what you do. Are you still interested in it? If not, find something else. If you are, then do whatever you need to do to advance it. Find some opportunity that's like, you know, someplace where you can do that project and work on it better. Find some place where you can have more energy behind it. Sometimes as the, uh, oh, our, 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 ancestors tell us a change is as good as a rest. Even if you go someplace and do the exact same thing, you're doing it in a new place. And we all know this. If somebody hires, they're, they're looking for somebody with, you know, 20 years of experience or whatever they're looking for, you're not going to be effective on day one. It's impossible. You have to go and learn how they do it there. Right. So don't take that as a thing like, oh, I'm going to go and I'm not going to know anything. Yeah, you're not going to know anything. You have to learn. You're gonna have to learn how they do deployments. How do they do PRs? How do they, you know, how they work? Do they have hackathons periodically? Do they have team structures that are product based, or are they system based? Like everybody does it a different way. Go see doing it a different way. Even if you do the exact same thing, it's gonna be different. Cool. Um, okay. So that person uh, later said that they actually meant 15 years younger, and that's <laughs> to me a really good indication that you're staying in your job too long. The average time in Silicon Valley proper, I mean, here in California, that people stay in jobs is like two and a half years. Right. And that nobody, is the only nobody. way that you get, you, you will not be able to work the system from inside your company to get all the way to the top. The, the one guy that can do that is a total unicorn. 
the way that you enhance your salary is you get to a milestone where you've done something. You can say, I did this. And then you go find another job. That's exactly right. Find, find, you know, look at, look back because sometimes it's hard. Look back and make yourself uh, what one of my friends calls a brag book, right? Here's a problem I solved. Here's the problem. Here's what it took. Here's what I did. Here's the outcome. Write that stuff down. I guarantee you, you are losing track of the things that you've worked on just because they go into the blur of every day. So keep a, a whatever, keep a notepad window open, a physical scratch pad on your desk, whatever works for you, but take those things down because then also kind of makes it easier when it comes around for review time and you've got a list of all the stuff you did. You just yeah. boom, put it in there and you're moving on. And then if you're, if you're subject to most, most women, one of the things I know about bias from working at PayPal is most female resumes use assistive verbs because we don't like to take too much credit. So we yep. say, I, I helped, I worked on a team with, I helped. And the same resume written by a man for the same experience would say, I wrote, I made, mm -hmm. I did, right? Own it. And so that's the other thing is, is check your verbs. And while it's uncomfortable to me to think about taking more credit than I deserve, if I want to compete in the marketplace with men who are doing that, then I have to get comfortable with it. And, right? and I know there is also a school of thought and it comes probably from our parents' generation where you go work for one company and you stay there till you retire. We all know that's a lot of hot nonsense. And you know anybody that, that looks at your resume, if you've spent two years, two years, two years, and is like, oh, You've had a lot of jobs be like, yep, I went for some new opportunities. I got the opportunity, the chance to do something over here because I like this company because they had something I was looking for. Also, a very clever friend told me one time, you might not be great at and I suck at for sure. Knowing what next title you want, right? Like, where do you see yourself in five years? Frankly, anybody who answered that five years ago, totally wrong, just by the way. So. I don't know how to say that where I see myself in five years because that I feel like limits me. Instead, focus on values that are important to you and look for companies that support or embrace those. Yeah. Find a place that mirrors your personal value statement so that you can go and know that you're, even if you're not working on say some life-saving application, you're at least working at a company that understands the value of being present in our society, making sure that they treat people fairly and equitably. I think the two most important questions that any new job seeker, or any job seeker can ask going forward are, how did you treat your employees during pandemic times? Did you lay off a bunch of people? Did you make salary cuts? Did you freeze? What did you do? And what did you do to support people during the social unrest that has happened over the last six to eight months and beyond? Did you turn your Twitter logo black for a day or did you do something material to support the, the, the wider society around you? Right. So like, look at those things and see what mirrors yours. And I know this again comes from a place of privilege where you can you know, be discerning about it. But if you're old, you've been doing this a while, right? So your next job, you can look more carefully at the place you're going to go. You don't just need to have any job. You can but have also, the job. But also, we, we got to say one more thing. It is easier to find a job when you already have one. So For don't sure. wait until you quit or get That's pushed right. out of a company. Always be interviewing. Literally yeah. always be interviewing. Always be. Look, I just got a new tattoo recently. It says always be. It means whatever you're doing, go for it. Do it. Do it with your whole self. Bring your whole self to that thing. So yeah, like I never turn off my, are you interested in more opportunities on LinkedIn? Yeah, I'm not always either. actively seeking, but heck the last three jobs I've had have come to me. And for some reason, all of a sudden I'm super hot right now. Like I'm getting all kinds of like interview requests right now. It's fun, isn't it? I think everybody is. is a little bit super hot right now. I, is, I, right? I'm getting a lot of them myself and I live in Ireland. So <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Okay, we got 10 minutes and we got a lot of questions to go through. So I'm going to try to squish them down. Um, okay, so let's see. Oh, here's somebody who wants to, who, somebody who's 27 and wants to understand if there's so many openings, why aren't 40 somethings getting jobs quickly? Um, so sometimes it's because that the people are not applying for those jobs. Sometimes it's because the company lacks the foresight to understand that they need those perspectives. Keep looking because they're out there, I promise. And in the meantime, I'm going around telling them, stop it. That's nonsense. You need to hire yeah, those people. Me too. And by yeah. the way, there are companies that are focusing on hiring older people. Yes. AWS is one of them. 
Yes. Look carefully. They've hired some very high profile old people lately, and that's Absolutely. happening through their whole stack. Okay. I, I, um, I think people are seeing that. And it's any on. thoughts about getting certificates? I mean, I, I think if it's something that you enjoy doing and it's something that you really want to stay in, do it. But honestly, do you remember how big a deal CCNA was like however many years ago? Now, if you see that on somebody's resume, it's like, okay, great. What have you done since then? The problem, the only problem with getting certifications is that that's, that's a fixed point in time, right? And you want to keep learning. So if you're going to learn and there's a certification you can get to prove that you learned it, great. But don't spend a lot of money on that. If your company will pay for it, awesome. Don't spend a lot of personal money because certifications are, are, are the same as degrees. Like, yeah, you've got it. But honestly, can you solve a problem with code? That's, yeah, that's right. what I care about. Yeah, that's what I do too. Okay, here's somebody, Hannah is in her late 30s, switched to tech after a previous career. And she's wondering how she balances learning a lot of things with becoming a subject matter expert. She can see the benefits of both, but doesn't feel like she's a master of either. My answer would be follow what's interesting to you. Yes, yes. If you're not passionate about it, it doesn't matter. So like if, if, you know, look, dabble around until you find something that hooks you and then lean in hard, find that place that, that makes you feel good. And there's going to be, there's a place, any place, to, something that you're interested in, somebody's doing it and somebody wants it. Here's what should I be learning for the next five years? Let me say that if you don't right now have a subscription to Redmonk, you need to. Redmonk is a, an independent analyst firm. They're great guys, and they do a quarterly report about what's happening with languages in actual employment and deployment. And that is a good way, if you are really stuck and you've got to choose between three, you can figure out who's, who's climbing, who's falling. And the Stack Overflow survey every year is also a good indication of like what's hot at the moment. So um, you can lean into that and see like where people are getting hired and what people who are actually working are working on. Okay, there's a couple of people who want to continue this conversation, which I'm, get, I'm betting you're going to say your, your chapter of Women Who Code might host that. There's some Absolutely. people who also want old in tech swag. <laughs> I feel like we should do that. Maybe I will set up a Redbubble store and I will send you the link. It feels like we could do that. I Great. feel like so an old is a statement. Are you going to, are you going to um, try to host this conversation on an ongoing basis at Sheyu? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. We will, um, we will, um, I, I'll set something up for women who code come to uh, meet up and find us on meetup and you'll see, you'll have the details. Uh, all are welcome. Okay. If you are bored with your current work, have a dream, but don't have a path towards the dream. How do you build that path? My answer is, believe it or not, starting to talk about your dream can materially take you there. Yes. Yeah. Manifest it. Honestly, like uh, if it's a thing that you're interested in and you're really interested in it, say it out loud because I guarantee you somebody else is thinking about it. And if not, and if you like talk to 10 people and nobody's thinking about it, then you've got an original idea. Run with it. Own it. Right. As you, you've got this. But also don't surround yourself with people who are telling you that you shouldn't be able to do that or you can't yeah. do that or, you know, I once had to turn my husband off. He was so certain because I'd lost my job. It was 2008. It was a bad time for me to lose my job. And he was like, oh, my God, what's going to happen to us? And I said, look, you taught me this game. You have to stop that now. And the next day, Wikipedia called and asked if I wanted to be their CTO. So it really does happen. Exactly. And, and that's the thing, too, is that like if you're having trouble finding somebody who will back your dream, poke me, text me, find me on LinkedIn. I'll be here to I'm, I, I will be your personal cheerleader. OK, on your resume, how do you highlight experience in industries other than tech in a way that's valued by employers? Tell me a story that's that that's going to hook me. Tell me why, why I care. And that, honestly, that applies to, to, to uh, tech as well. Like, don't just throw a link to your GitHub repo in there. Tell me why I care. I'm not going to go trolling through your code looking for gems. Tell me what problem you solved, what technology you used, what did you learn? Tell me the story of that thing, and then I'm going to be hooked. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And I have the world's weirdest resume. But people, Same. it's almost <laughs> like they want to meet me because my resume is so bizarre. Right, um, exactly. Okay, here's a mom who wants, to, wants advice about hitting pause or slowing down on the career while the kids are little and then unpausing later. Um, this is a challenge she's worried about for, the, for their future as she's got little kids. Totally understand. I stopped for about five years, but I was always doing something, right, in the background. Um, so something that interests you, come hang out with women who code. Um, take the time that you feel like is important. You're never going to get that time back with your kids. I know it sounds cliche, but lean in. If that's something you enjoy, 
I mean, I always knew I was going to keep working even when my kids were little, um, because that's what that's what sparks me is that sort of interaction. But don't don't regret. Do whatever you do. Do whatever feels right and don't regret it, because there's plenty of companies, big companies that have pathways back into tech. Uh, Red Ventures in Charlotte. IBM has return ships, Blue Cross Blue Shield. There's a bunch of places who are embracing that because it helps their diversity numbers. So there's a lot of places who are asking people to come back. If you've spent some time out, come back with us and they'll pay you to do it. Yeah, I agree. There, there's people are starting to realize that you're a known quantity. And, and um, you know, if you're a proven worker, they're interested in you still, even if you don't think they are. So the other thing is you can always volunteer with your spare time as you're yes. ramping back in. And yes. I know several people that have taken internships in companies that later, later IPO'd and it was the making of them. So don't be afraid to work for free on your way back in. Okay. Um, oh, as in different areas of diversity, are there language changes we should embrace when talking about ourselves? Well, I already said the one about the verbs, active verbs in your resume. Absolutely. But Absolutely. what else have we got? Experienced, right? You've spent some time doing a thing. It's not because it's not that you've like spent, you know, you're, you're proven, you have a proven track record. You are um, a, an established subject matter expert in whatever, like embrace the things that denote time. I don't include the year that I graduated from college on my resume, but I do show all of the jobs that I feel like are relevant and that I learned something from and that I can use to weave into my story. And now somebody is going to ask, what do you do about gaps in your resume? How do you handle them? Again, tell that story. I mean, I, you know, again, I don't, I don't tend to put a lot of dates on my resume. I do things sequentially, or you put together a skills-based resume that doesn't matter. Right. So like I have these things I learned, I did this while I was here, but I did it here too. I did this in three places. There are always ways that you can tell your story. And if you have trouble with that, find somebody who's good at resume writing. There's tons of consultants out there that will help you with that. I'm happy to look over your resume too. I know what I'm looking for as a hiring manager is somebody who can tell me that story. So it doesn't I have, have a rule. Be. I have a rule where I only use collective pronouns when I'm in a job. We did this. We did that. We're working on this. And when I'm writing my resume, I use first person singular. Right. And, and I switch between the two because when you're writing your resume, they don't care so much about what the team did unless they're hiring you to run a team. You know, otherwise they right. wanted, they want to know what you did, what did you do? and that's not yeah. comfortable for most of us. Um, okay. Let's see specific tips to position yourself on LinkedIn or interviews with, with your years being an asset to avoid ageism. Um, I don't know that I have any specific LinkedIn tips, but lean in and don't, don't be afraid of it. I know there's a lot of people who are, are reluctant to say that, that they've had a lot of experience in a place or whatever write a good headline, you know, experienced technology leader. That's a great way to say that you've been doing this a while. There are ways that you can craft that, but like put all the things on there on LinkedIn. I like get endorsements from people who said you were good at a thing. Those are great too. Yeah, those are really good. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Here's somebody that that's a baby going by. Here's somebody who wants to know if you still get, have to do the whiteboard interview thing when you're in your forties. So, Here's the thing. I categorically refuse to whiteboard in any circumstance. It does not prove anything except for that you can write on a whiteboard. It's inherently biased. It's not how we work. I want to interview with a company that has an interview process that shows me something about the way they work. And unless they make their engineers stand up in front of a whiteboard and code in front of the whole company, don't do that to me during an interview. It's disrespectful. So I don't. And I yeah, don't make anybody I, that either. I have not coded and I haven't asked anybody to code in front of a whiteboard in a long time. At Wikipedia, we used to give people uh, the option to take home homework and turn it in yep. and give that. That's a fairer test because Absolutely, the yes. truth is you, you use the Internet when you code. Exactly right? right. Exactly right. And I don't buy into the like, well, I had to do it, so you have to do it, too. That's a bunch of nonsense. So, yeah. Clear of OK, companies. how many programming languages in your resume before you start sounding suspicious? I know 12, but I'm proficient in three and I only list these three, but others may be useful. I always list things like experience with or, you know, um, you've worked if you've worked with it. That actually can be a thing. And honestly, I'm not yeah. suspicious because there are people who polyglot. Once you've learned one or two, you can learn five or ten. Right. So like that doesn't make me suspicious as a hiring manager. But like make sure that it's not like I've seen the word Haskell written somewhere. Right. Like make sure that you actually know something <laughs> about it because they'll call you on it. Right. So like and also intelligently to speak about it, include it. 
And also, don't list stuff that that they really aren't looking for. They don't care if you know COBOL, I promise you, unless that's what the job's about, right? <laughs> right, unless it's legacy systems moving on, exactly. <laughs> and if it is, you should be making $300 an hour for that. Yes, exactly um, right. <laughs> all right, here's a good omnibus question that we'll call, count as our last question. How do you make great strides in your career? Any specific ways to jump ahead? I'm almost 40 with a nonlinear career trajectory. I, I don't know about jumping ahead. Just keep looking for those opportunities. Keep making the connections because you don't know what's going to springboard you. Like I was not interested in management until somebody was like, hey, do you want to be a manager? And then I was like, hey, you know what? I kind of do. Be open to any possibility and, and, and don't limit yourself to the things that you can see right now. If I limited myself, I wouldn't have had probably half the jobs I had. So just be open to any possibility and you will find yourself. It's going to be, you know, you'll find a, you'll find a springboard. I think don't be afraid to um, take a step back. If you get, if you talk yeah. yourself into a career move that isn't comfortable, uh, you want to be happy at work and there's no harm in taking a step back. Although people will look at you funny. Um, <laughs> you might have to change companies to have people not look at you strangely, but yep. some of the smartest moves I've seen have been that taking a step back move. And um, other than that, I, I think just being open, there, there, there are some jobs that are actually impossible jobs. I talked about Wikipedia CTO earlier. That was an impossible job when I took it, right? It almost killed me. I mean, it was totally worth it. And, I, and it's, since it's on my resume now, you know, it has changed the tenor of the conversations I have, but, but it did almost kill me. And it's, it's not always good to, you know, to push, if you know what I'm saying. But one of the great ways to, to catapult yourself forward is become a public speaker. And there are more yeah. and more opportunities to do that because of these virtual events. And there are ways to get good at it. Yeah, come speak to Women Who Code. We're a very accepting and open audience. We wanna hear whatever you have to say.